The sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection can involve multiple organ systems and are often grouped together as long COVID or post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. But the terms themselves are nebulous, the clinical presentations are variable, and the prognosis is uncertain. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Clifford Rosen, Associate Director of Clinical and Translational Research at the Maine Health Institute for Research, a professor at Tufts University School of Medicine, and an associate editor at the journal. Dr. Rosen has co-authored a perspective article about next steps in efforts to understand long COVID and to care for patients with the syndrome. Dr. Rosen, you write in your perspective article that there is no well-accepted definition of long COVID, but nonetheless, what are the general symptoms that are often grouped under this umbrella? The major movement towards sort of defining a syndrome or defining long COVID is by clustering symptomatology into two or three large categories. So, for example, cardiac pulmonary shortness of breath or chest pain, and that becomes one sort of cluster along with dizziness and inability to stand up quickly because of lightheadedness. The other clusters are neuro which are really related to both nerve pain, muscle pain, and also a general fogginess, what patients describe as brain fog. And then there's a third sort of large cluster, which is gastrointestinal and metabolic. And that relates more to changes in glucose tolerance so that individuals have now been shown to have signs of type 2 diabetes. They also have a lot of complaints of abdominal pain and bloating and diarrhea. And so those are the three sort of major clusters that we talk about, but one definition is still not there and might not ever be there since this is probably a couple of syndromes within a larger sort of syndrome of quote unquote long COVID. What's known about the number of people in the United States and worldwide who may have long COVID and about the severity of their symptoms. So this is really interesting. In here, we've made some advances. And in the Recover NIH longitudinal study, it's become clear that in the Omicron era, about 10% of individuals who have acute COVID due to Omicron are likely to have symptoms three months out. It's a little less clear about the earlier waves of infection, including Delta, where estimates were as high as 20 or 30 percent. But clearly, we're beginning to understand that lack of vaccination, repetitive COVID infections are associated with a greater risk of long COVID. And then what treatment options are available for people with long COVID? So that's the real problem is we have no established treatment. And this has led to a lot of frustration, both at the patient level and at the provider level. There are lots of possibilities out there on the web that have been tried from hyperbaric oxygen to natural food products, to exercise, to infrared exposure. Right now, there's no established treatment and the approach has been basically to try to treat symptoms. However, it's been very discouraging because outcomes have not changed much in terms of the patient's persistence of symptomatology. Starting in July, though, the NIH is starting their first large randomized trial for the treatment of long COVID using Paxlovid as one of the interventions. And we're all looking forward to really the first large-scale intervention study to see if that might help. And the reason or rationale for using Paxlovid is the leading hypothesis that long COVID may be due to persistence of the virus in various depots around the body. And so by treating the virus directly with an antiviral might have a impact on long COVID symptoms. You talk in your article about the stigmatization of people with long COVID and a relatively poor penetration of care to marginalized populations. But what are the biggest obstacles to ensuring that everyone with the syndrome has access to comprehensive care? So I think, Steve, a couple of things. One is that we have a fragmented healthcare system to begin with, so it's not easy to access your primary care provider, particularly with these sort of vague symptomatologies which are often dismissed as not being real 
or stigmatized as being, oh, this is just chronic fatigue, not to worry sort of thing. And so I think the biggest barrier is that their access is limited by the symptomatology and also by the anxiety and difficulties that providers have in treating somewhat vague symptomatology. So what their response often is, is to refer to a particular specialist. And that fragmentation just gets enhanced as these individuals go on to subspecialty referrals and testing without sort of a complete interdisciplinary evaluation of their symptomatology. Both you and your co-author are investigators in the Research in COVID-19 to Enhance Recovery, or RECOVER, initiative. So what have you learned so far as part of that project? Well, we've learned, I think, Steve, that this is a group of syndromes that are combined and lumped together as long COVID, that it has a devastating effect on the individuals that are affected long term. I don't think we realized when we first began recruiting individuals the depth and severity of the symptomatology and the persistence of this. There was some discussion that long COVID would end in three to six months and the symptoms would go away. And we find persistence of symptoms from the earliest epidemic infections in early spring of 2020. There are still individuals three years out that have the same or even worse symptoms than they had at the beginning. So I think we've learned that this is a chronic disease that it comes in multiple arrays, that it can present in so many different aspects that it requires a comprehensive evaluation. And we've learned about the frustration on the part of individuals who suffer from this in terms of treatment and recognition that this disease is a disease and that it does impact life quality and work capability. So I think we've learned a lot from our patients and our participants in Recover, and we've gathered enough information. We're now up to 14,000 plus individuals, and the data are beginning to accumulate. So I think we are really at a stage now we'll be able to better define what long COVID is and what some of the prognostic factors are that allow us to help patients understand what their clinical course will be. So you mentioned the workplace. Finally, in a related perspective article, Dorfman and Berger describe considerations for physicians when it comes to approving workplace accommodations for people with long COVID. So what role do you think physicians can play in promoting access to appropriate supports, medical and otherwise, for these patients? Well, I think they make a couple of outstanding points. One, documentation. Documentation of the symptomatology is really critical for evaluating medical records, particularly during disability. The physician becomes the keystone of an individual's ability to get disability or to be denied based on how they record their records, how they document symptomatology. And although it may seem that some symptoms are pretty vague, those symptoms really do represent part of the long COVID syndrome. The other thing that they stress, and I think this is really important, is the documentation using the ICD code, U09.9, which really is a code that was adopted in the fall of 2021 by the World Health Organization as a way to document any symptomatology that's 12 weeks or later after the acute COVID infection. And this becomes really important when we think about uh, disability. I just had a disability case offered to me from one of our subjects. And in it, there were probably 20 questions that are fairly standard now. And the most important thing is that those questions be answered appropriately and be documented in a provider's records. So I think that will go a little ways towards helping individuals if they, in fact, are disabled. Thank you, Dr. Rosen. 